Okay, it's that time of month again. It's the last uh, week of the month, and we're, it's our pleasure to have Harris Kupperman for Cuppy Corner back. Harris, great to have you with us. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, so listen, I just I got uh, uh, this email from my old man, and he says something like, Harris has done it again. And I was like, what, the, what is he talking about? And then he said, with his retail play. And I take it that you nailed another trade. So why don't you tell us about it? Well, like, tell us the whole story and, and if it's still a buy up here. So I'm not sure if I've nailed a trade yet. I mean, I'm up 30% uh, this week, but I mean, look, I, I bought it, what, like Tuesday? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a victory yet. I bought well, it, it's uh, funny. I, actually, I, I just, Harris, one question for you. Do you think that you're actually moving it? Do you think that that big up day was you or was it just the Oh, goodness? of course it is. Harris it's, has that much influence the Harris, on the market. It's the cuppy effect. It's the cuppy, cuppy effect, effect for sure. <laughs> yes, yes. Two thirds of shares outstanding traded in the last four days, and it's all my fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why do you give us this story, Harris? Okay, so a uh, company's called Stage Stores. Uh, ticker symbol is SSI. Uh, it's been around forever. They had the brilliant uh, strategy to roll up a bunch of dying uh, department stores. If anyone hasn't paid attention, department stores are comping like negative 10 every year. Uh, they, they, they figured they'd put a bunch of them together and hope to make up in volume. Uh, they, they were basically just bleeding <laughs> it's, 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 it's one of these stocks that like every six months, one of my friends is like, but there's a lot of asset value left. And you just see the asset value kind of leak away. And you're just like, nope, not anymore. Uh, <laughs> but look, I've watched this thing melt away from like uh, 20 bucks to less than a dollar. And so anyway, they – uh, two years ago, they bought Gordman's, which was yet another uh, department store chain. They bought it out of bankruptcy. And Gordman's, somewhere deep in the bowels of Gordman's, they had this uh, off-price retail business. You know, off-price being like TJ Maxx, Ross Stores, uh, you know, Burlington. And if you look at any of the charts of these things, they're just up and to the right. Consistently, they just keep going. And it's just a great business. You're on trend. Millennials love bargains. I mean, I love bargains. And so it's just been a great business. And these guys looked at this uh, Gordman's and they said, hey, we could do this. And they started uh, converting some of their shittier department stores in cities with no people into Gordman's. And the amazing thing happened is they started comping positive. And so they started doing more of it. And in 2019, they converted uh, 89 stores and they had an astronomical 40, 40 positive comp, which is, just doesn't happen in retail. You know, ad admittedly, that means that instead of five people that month, it's seven people. But it's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who the hell shops at these things? They're like worse than a J.C. Petty. Uh, like, you, I, like, do you know anyone who's been to a Beals? Uh, Bells? I don't even know how to pronounce the thing. But they have 800 right. of these stores. And uh, so they've been converting these things. And all year long, they've been uh, announcing that comps are getting better, comps are getting better, but everyone ignored it because it's a small little piece of the business. And so, so anyway, um, on Wednesday, they announced that they are going to convert all of their stores, all the remaining stores this year to uh, this Gordman's, which is a terrible brand name, but to this Gordman's off price because they did positive 40 comps. And as I said, positive 40 comps doesn't happen in retail, you know. Up teens is, uh, you know, life's changing and that your stock doubles. And so here you have this plus 40 and, you know, no one really knows what's going to happen, but it seems like the ones they've already done are going great. And I don't think it's a great investment. I think it's actually probably a terrible investment, but I think it's one of these, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's one of these things where people want to believe. I mean, everyone's had a bad year in the land of value. There's a lot of value still here. Uh, people want to believe that you can do plus 40 comps next year on all the conversions. And I tend to think that you probably don't get 40s, but you probably get teens. And maybe you get a little better. I mean, remember, you're coming from a super low base in terms of uh, sales per foot. And I just think this is an up, up and to the right until they bungle it all this time next year. But you probably have two or three quarters where, you know, the earnings won't be good. No one will care. There'll be one-time charges. No one will care. As long as the comps are good and the comps have been good. It's just going to trade up, and look, it's 125 million market cap today. I bought it at about an 85 million market cap. I mean, if you compare this to their peers, which are trading at like two, three times sales, and these guys are less than 0.1 times sales, there's a lot of gap to close. I mean, if these guys get to 0 0.3, 0 0.4 times sales, you have a multi-bagger from here. Uh, and if they actually do something like a reasonable uh, gross margin, I mean, 
I could build a model that says these guys make a few dollars a share and it's only trading at $5. I mean, I don't right. think that's actually what happens, but I think guys will make that model and it's going to trade up to the right. So I wrote about so, it, uh, what it was at three and a half, and here we are at five. Do you have uh, any opinions on the other retailers? Because, I mean, we saw Bed Bath & Beyond uh, have a big turn up. Uh, you saw uh, everything from uh, Best Buy, Tailored Brand seems to be putting in a bottom. Like a lot of these retailers were just destroyed. I mean, Macy's is still down at the bottom end of its range. But uh, do, you, do you think that these things were just like the baby's been thrown out with the bathwater uh, on all of these and there's a uh, huge room for mean reversion in value on on the retail space no <laughs> <laughs> i love the honesty perfect no <laughs> i mean i guess the joke I, so like take take bed bath okay about once a week one of my friends is like it's so cheap i'm like yeah you, you've been telling me that since we were at 60 and you know and we, we got to uh, 10 then we got to single digits and i, I guess the joke was always when bed bath goes bankrupt where's my wife gonna waste my money um, <laughs> I mean, I, I literally come home on like a Sunday and there's like nine bags of this shit. And I, I'm like, you spent $500 at Bed Bath? But I guess people still shop there. I, I don't know why. We have like new blenders and new knives and forks and whatever it is once a week. But um, no, I, I still don't understand why these exist. Like one, you have terrible uh, competitive issues because you have a bunch of guys like Wayfair. Like just look at like Bed Bath versus Wayfair. Wayfair is – been as clear as possible they intend to lose more money each year and hope to basically bankrupt bed bath <laughs> like how do you compete with that it's it's impossible they're just going to keep gaining market share um i don't know tailored brands look i think uh, the tuxedo business they have is a true competitive moat business um i've been to enough of these weddings where you know, you're all supposed to have the same exact uh, Calvin Klein tuxedo because you're all in the wedding party and we're all in, coming from different states. And the only place that you could go that has a location in every state is Taylor Brands. So, yes, they have a moat. But when was the last time you wore a suit? <laughs> like, I so, happen to wear a couple every yeah, once in a while. But... <laughs> so, Harris, you know, you and I were it's Kevin here. We, we were chatting yesterday and I noticed uh, – a certain new spring in your step and uh, kind of a reju rejuvenated Harris is, uh, is back in the, <laughs> is back in the game. And I, I what do you attribute this to? Oh, uh, vacation. <laughs> Got to take a, I took, I took three weeks off in the Caribbean. I feel great. Uh, my, my brain feels great. Look, I had a pretty shitty Q3. Uh, you know, uh, the, look, the global economy ain't so pretty and I've been short and market just keeps going to new highs and, it was an expensive uh, opinion. And so I just said to hell with it, uh, cleared out my book. I, I literally went down to like five positions, like my core book, and went on vacation for three weeks. And, you know, the great thing about going on vacation, you know, especially like somewhere like the Caribbean where the internet doesn't work too well, is you're not tempted to take out your laptop and log in and try to do something stupid. You just totally clear your head. <laughs> So, Harris, after this, I, I'd like you to get on the phone with Mrs. Macrotourist and suggest that that's what I need on a more regular basis. Absolutely. You know, before I started my hedge fund, I started my hedge fund in January this year. Uh, I pretty much every six months took a month off. And I went there and my wife and I, we'd go rent a you know car and we'd just start driving around, whatever the country is. And, you know, you kind of check in. But Unless it's earnings season, the odds that something's going to happen in one of my positions is minimal. And if it does, someone will call me. So yep. it's, it's just great to get away. And then I started my hedge fund and I forgot that tradition. And, you know, when you get 10 months into the year and you haven't had a bit of time off, you, 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 you forget that you can actually step away and, you know, the portfolio is still there. And I mean, but I've, I've come back and I've said, yeah, so they're going to print a bunch of money. The market's probably going to go up and the economy is going to collapse and we might just pull a Zimbabwe. And I mean, you can't short the market. It's, so, I mean, well, I, I just, I've. I've definitely noticed that kind of a, a, a definite new Harris. So I think that, that we should uh, encourage everyone to take three months off in the Caribbean whenever you're feeling a little down. <laughs> three months, three weeks. Or, sorry, three weeks. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm turning that's uh, I'm trying to up it. I've, I figure three weeks isn't quite enough. Three months is what you need. So why don't you give us an update on some of your other names that uh, I know you wanted to remind everyone that you're no longer in the Greek uh, ETF. Why don't you just kind of touch base with that? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, the, the trade worked. It worked uh, well. It's up 20% from where I put it on. And, you know, it just felt like it was stalling out. The, uh, as I said, the global economy ain't so good. And 
most of the Greek economy still is people going to see the Parthenon. And so, you know, when, when you're <laughs> – I didn't even mean that to be funny. I meant that to be factual. <laughs> <laughs> That's even funny. <better. laughs> but so you, you got, um, you know, there's just less people who have disposable income to go tourist. And you I mean the economy's uh, not going as fast as I thought it would be. And I just said, okay, I have a victory, move on. And when, you, you know, when, you, when you're doing trend investing, which is a lot of what I do, you know, some of these trends do better than you expect. Some do worse. And a lot of them are kind of baseline. I, I'd say you know, the gr- Greek trend was kind of like a four out of 10. It, didn't quite do what I thought it would do, but it didn't exactly fail. And I figured I'd just mention it that I that I'm out. And uh, I don't yeah, want anyone. I'll to take the other side of that trade. I think Cuppy is headed higher. I think you're not being patient enough, but that's what makes a market. Why don't you tell us about the one you are excited about, which is our tanker stocks? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was going to say, you know, sometimes they don't go as well as you expect, and sometimes they go a lot better. And all year long, the story at uh, Scorpio, or pretty much all tanker stocks, just keeps getting better and better. Um, you know, the, the newest thing is, you know, we haven't even finished IMO 2020 and we're already thinking IMO 2030. Uh, IMO 2030 is this sort of nebulous set of regulations that everyone knows is coming, but no one knows what it actually says, which is probably going to make any vessel you order today obsolete by 2030. And so if you're ordering a vessel and you expect to have it on the oceans for 20 to 25 years and, you know, year six, seven or eight, it's obsolete. Like, are you going to order something today? And so... If you look at all bull markets in shipping, they always end when people start making money and they grow their fleets. So guys might not grow their fleets this cycle or maybe not grow as fast as previous cycles because no one wants to be the guy who orders you know, the, the last model of a diesel propulsion, propulsion ship and learns that it's obsolete next year. So well, it just keeps getting Elon better. Elon Musk is going to give us all battery uh, kind of ships by then, I'm sure. Well, I think that's what a lot of these regulations are looking towards. It's probably going to be hydrogen. It might be LNG. It might be methane. I mean, there's a lot of propulsion systems you can use that use like produce less carbon dioxide. The problem is, if no one knows what the rules are, no one's going to order anything. So it'll actually be a bigger bull market because of that fact. Because right, of the uncertainty right. that that'll stop the the supply response that we'll get with the higher prices, that it won't come. I guess and to com- combine that with the fact that everyone is still probably doesn't believe, and although there are some people that are waking up to these tanker stocks, let's face it, in the grand picture, they barely moved. Right. I mean, look, in the last month, the short interest in Scorpio has doubled. I mean, who the hell is shorting a stock where management's telling you they're going to earn twenty five dollars this year and the stock is at thirty four? Like, I just don't get it. <laughs> wow. That's People true. just don't believe it. You know, well, look, they've been lied to a lot. It, it's actually, I, I was joking <laughs> with a. So, I mean, I used uh, some of the proceeds from my Greek ETF to go buy some more sh- uh, tanker sh- uh, stocks. And some of my friends just kind of said that I shifted one set of Greeks for a different set of Greeks. <laughs> <laughs> that actually probably is right. But. Uh, so are you, are are there other Greeks? Uh, sorry, the Greek stocks. <laughs> other <laughs> shipping stocks that you're watching there? Yeah, there's a bunch. I mean, LPG is doing great. Um, you know, if you want to really go out of the spectrum on the risk side, there's a company called Navios where you know they're kind of guiding. It's look, it's an eight dollar stock. They're kind of guiding that they're going to earn something like forty or fifty this year. I mean, if if they don't, they're not going to roll their debt next year. So it's sort of binary, but. I mean, it could be zero, it could be 100 next, this time next year. Like, you just don't really know. But you have this sort of operating leverage where if you look at uh, tanker rates, pretty much every day they're going higher. I mean, we're at 10-year highs, and they're not pulling back. They're just going to keep going. Uh, a buddy of mine who works at a large trading house in Singapore reached out to me today, uh, and he said kind of like we'd been jo- like questioning this for a while. And he's like, Cuppy, it's actually happening. W- what's happening? Well – all this high sulfur fuel that the refineries produce, they have no idea what to do with it, which is sort of something we'd speculated, but we didn't really know. He's like, they just ordered an Aframax. They're going to store it on the Aframax. So that's one vessel. Who cares? But you know, if you have a refinery, you produce this low sulfur stuff, this, this high sulfur stuff that no one right now needs because everyone's going to burn low sulfur starting in January. Well, where's this stuff going to go? Well, you're going to use up your land storage. And then what do you do with it? Well, you're going to have to start taking uh, tankers out of the market and your floating storage. So you have a bunch of uh, tankers that should be earning a lot of money crisscrossing the oceans. They're going to be sitting there storing fuel, like pretty much waste fuel that no one can burn unless you have a scrubber, which is only a small piece of the fleet. So you're going to see the global fleet that's available to trade potentially shrink dramatically at a time when demand is growing fast. So it just keeps getting better and better. 
you think people will go and and be faced with like a storage constraint and use these uh, ships as their floating storage? Okay, so you have a refinery. No one needs high sulfur fuel today, okay? Because yeah. there's not a lot of scrubbers. Well, when you refine crude oil, your waste product is low sulfur is high sulfur fuel. It's just you could re-refine it, but it's very expensive, and you're just going to end up with high sulfur fuel when you re-refine it. So what do you do with this stuff? Like guys in Nigeria, they burn it for electricity or something, but there's only so many power plants <laughs> in the world that can burn this stuff. I mean, yeah. you have you have above ground tanks, you use your above ground tanks, and it has to go somewhere. You can't just dump it in the ocean. And it, it's, it's going into Aframax, apparently. Wow. Wow. I, I don't think Al Gore is going to be very happy about that if we started burning <laughs> it, by the way. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we got that. Now let's go on to the other one, which is the uranium stocks. What are you thinking there? Are we ever going to get a, a rally? And is this uh, is this like waiting for Godot? Uh, it's a waiting game. Look, uh, I don't own any uranium stocks. I own uranium participation. Uh, that's the only one to own because it's physical uranium. All these other stocks, you have to remember that you know the vast majority of them aren't producers. So if you're not producing and you have no revenue – you basically have kind of a scumbag sitting there spending your money on investor relations or, you know, his personal <laughs> travel or <laughs> for those who for those mining uranium mining companies that want to reach Harris, it's H Cuppy at Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, go on, but, sorry. So uranium participation is the only thing just because we're below the cost of production and why buy a mine with all sorts of risk when you can buy the actual fundamental underlying, uh, you know, commodity at less than the cost of production. Is that basically the, the thought process? Right. I mean, well, look, there's, there's a couple sets of these. You have the guys that um, don't have a mine, never will have a mine. They just own some pasture somewhere and they're just selling you a, a dream. Look, there's enough shuttered mines out there in the world today that when the price of uranium goes up, these mines will come back online. Because it's easier to flip a switch. Well, it's not even that simple. But to turn your existing mine on than to build a brand new mine. And when all the new mines, all the existing mines come online, all the uh, prospective new greenfield mines will never come online. So what you have effectively is some pasture in Alberta. You don't have a mine. So stop thinking you have a mine. Stop emailing me and telling me how cheap it is on a market cop to pounds in the ground. Because th th those pounds will be in the, ma in the ground when I die. <laughs> I'm just – it's it's just it's like a logical. Hopefully it's uh, not. Hopefully point. it's not at the hands of a a, a disgruntled mining a uranium mining executive. <laughs> <Harris. laughs> so now, what uh, do you think on uranium uh, participation? Like, do you think that uh, like you own this? Is it a large position for you? Like, I don't. You don't need to tell us exactly, but is it something that that you use as a buffer for the volatility in your portfolio? And and do you expect this to be a double over the next year? Or like, what is your kind of your sizing and your and your kind of risk reward of where you think it heads from here. So it's a it's a medium sized position. Uh, you know I have a rule I don't do anything for less than five percent. Uh, okay. I just found if you take small positions you don't watch them closely you're pretty much guaranteed to screw them up. I mean my average position size is about ten percent. I'm usually a six to fifteen six to twelve name fund. So I'm playing big. So this is about okay. an average size position. Look, uranium's trading at 25 right now. Uranium participation trades uh, a few ticks below NAV. Uh, I think uranium's probably 50 at some point in the next two to three years. I just don't know when. And maybe it overshoots when we get to 75. So I think it's a pretty low risk double to triple. And you don't get a lot of those where you're pretty much guaranteed that in the next few years you will double or triple your money with almost no possible uh, risk to yourself because, look, it's going to cost me a penny a quarter to hold on to this thing. That's the carrying cost. It's marginable. Uh, so it's not tying up my balance sheet. And look, I don't think uranium goes below 20 again. And if it does, I'll just buy more. So there's no yeah. risk of permanent loss. It's just kind of mark to market yeah. loss. Like why wouldn't you have a lot of this? And you know, my thinking is I started it uh, at a certain weighting. I'm going to add 50 bips every month. Uh, I'm going to average in. I, you know, I'm, I'm there at dime below the market at all times. And I'm just going to keep averaging in and I'll get it to a full position if it doesn't turn in two years. I'm just going to keep averaging in because I know I'm one month closer to the day where the above ground stocks get used. Sounds great. So Harris, listen, we're taping this on Tuesday afternoon. Um, it's going to air on Saturday, but it's just, uh, you are an American. So I wanted to, first of all, wish you a happy Thanksgiving and wonder what your plans are. You got anything exciting going on? My wife's taking us to go do Thanksgiving with her family. So that's all I know. I've not been told <laughs> where, how, when, at some point, probably Thursday afternoon, she'll get grumpy and, 
want to know why I'm not wearing my suit and I don't <laughs> wear suits. <laughs> and so I, I know what is uh do you watch football? Are you a football fan? No, not at all. Not at all. No, you're not a football fan. So it's just it's just Turkey and Thanksgiving and, and in the yet to be ter- determined location. Pretty much. And then there'll probably be some binge drinking afterwards. <laughs> well, sounds like a typical market huddle. There you go. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot for being on, Harris. Have a great Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll yeah, see you next Happy Thanksgiving, month. buddy. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, talk to you next month. Take All care. right. Bye-bye. Take care. Cheers, buddy.